and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Maddie Erlaub from Ada, Oklahoma, a junior studying English literature and oboe performance in the UW Mead Witter School of Music. I'm pleased to introduce faculty associate of oboe, Lindsay Flowers. Today, Lindsay will be sharing her personal journey to becoming a professional musician and how it prepared her to be resilient during these challenging times. In addition to Lindsay's performing and teaching work in Madison, she is the principal oboist of the Milwaukee Ballet Orchestra and English Hornet of the Quad City Symphony Orchestra. She was a member of the New Mexico Philharmonic and held fellowship with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago under the mentorship of the Chicago Symphony Association and Yo-Yo Ma. Please welcome Lindsay Flowers. Hey, Maddie, thanks so much for that wonderful intro. It's so great to work with you this year, and I look forward to all the time we have together in the next year. All right, well, we will get into the music perspectives, a look into a professional musician's life. Um, here at the Mead Witter School of Music, we're so fortunate to get to collaborate with the, um, with, uh, the Connects, UW Connects program and um, to be here with Badger Talk Live um, is a great privilege for me. So thanks for having me today. Here's a little uh, perspective on the presentation today, a little overview. We're going to start with um, talking a bit about developing self-resilience, self-reliance and resilience in these times and the consistency that that provides our days. I'm going to talk a bit about the morning ritual that um, I use with my warm-up routine and how that might inspire you in your journey. Um, we'll look into what it, what it, um, my journey was to becoming a professional musician and how that prepared me to be resilient in times uh, like right now. And then um, I'll, at the end, if we have a little bit of time, I'll share a bit about uh, the research that I've been doing for my dissertation, which is a curriculum design entitled School of Music, Student-Generated Community Engagement Projects, and how that opened my perspective a bit to the purpose of live performance. So a few questions for you to consider as we work through the materials today is, how do you find personal stability amid ever-changing life circumstances? How have you survived throughout this past year of the COVID pandemic when almost everything was canceled or moved online? How could your daily rituals bring mindfulness that you could apply to stressful situations that arise in your life? And do you have success stories of small habits resulting in long-term changes? Yeah, so this past year, we've had quite a bit of unexpected circumstances. As a musician, we have unexpected circumstances all the time that happens live and performing, as well as I have lived 10 different places in the past 10 years and how all of that I need to have something consistent in my life. So Twyla Tharp, who is a, a great um, choreographer for ballet at the New York City Ballet, she wrote this awesome book called The Creative Habit. And I have really, really enjoyed reading that lately. But one of her favorite things um, that she talks about is any approach that renews your self-confidence and keeps you moving forward is worth cultivating and repeating. That is so applicable to my morning ritual, my morning routine, developing a consistent thread that when I'm performing with an orchestra that's out of town and I'm sleeping overnight uncomfortably in a hotel room, I have that morning routine, my oboe warm-up routine that is my musical, technical, and mental home base. It opens my mind to creative thinking even when I'm at home and I'm practicing that during easy times, but it does provide the stability um, when I am among new situations where it might feel a bit more uncomfortable. So my warm-up routine as a musician, my goals are to have good breath control as well as the agility of being able to play my instrument cleanly and to have lovely phrasing. Um, so with the breathing, I play long tones, I play scales, and with my scales in between, I play all, like if I'm doing my major scales one day, I'll play through every major scale, all of them, and in between each one, I will either breathe in 
and then after the next one, I breathe out. And by doing that, it's slowing the pace of my breathing down. This is um, a practice that people use within yoga or other breath practices, but I find that really useful um, for my oboe warm-up routine. So for the technical agility to be able to play with ease and all these crazy technical things, I want to listen to the connection slowly between each note. And I want to have that, that articulation that doesn't get in the way of my line. Articulation is the way we use our tongue on the reed to separate notes. And that um, helps when I can use my air and use my articulation to stay on the line with that. And then with phrasing, I like to play um, some sort of etude every day, um, a beautiful melody, maybe something simple just to get my air going. And I want the, the phrasing to sound natural and beautiful, just as a singer would do without having to think so much about the barrier of the instrument between me and achieving that natural phrasing. So the etudes help me sing through my instrument. I haven't, uh, I'm gonna share a little bit about my athletic background and how that influenced my warm up routine and how transferring, like I would never show up to a, I was a volleyball player. So I would never show up to a volleyball match without having visited the weight room earlier in the day, warming up the muscles. I wouldn't have, uh, step on the court without having some sort of stretching routine, without studying the team that I was about to play. I would make sure that um, I've gone through the mental imagery of how I do my footwork in my blocking or in my approach or imagining the ball come over the net and where I need to be to, to have the dig for that. And um, another thing with athletics that is so applicable to my warm up routine is just sheer repetition. And whether it be hitting the ball against the wall 100 times in a row, just getting the control of that, that is just like what I do with my technique. Um, and what I do with that practice. So um, seeing the correlation between those two is something I'll kind of go into a little bit more here. Um, so while you read over these questions on the screen, I just want to have an example of a recording that I made of an etude um, uh, play. Great. So I, I hope you had a minute there to think about um, your morning ritual, what your warm-up routine might look like in your world, and think about 
your aspirations. This is something I do with my students. We always set goals with our instrument, but we set goals with our life in general. And what needs to happen in order to reach those goals? And then what are you willing to commit daily? That is something that a teacher can't tell a student. A student has to do that for themselves. And so um, that that's something that we work through a lot. I always like to celebrate um, at the end of maybe set a goal a month out and then reassess what you want to do for your warm up and uh, just reflect upon your work after that month. So yes, and embrace the process. We always want to think about maybe in, in music, we have auditions and it might feel like everything you're doing is working for this audition, but then it's just too much high pressure, but it, if you think of it, it's just all a process. So that audition is what will help you get towards your next audition and get towards your next goals. So um, yeah, always embracing the process. Oh, but this past year we have had all of our orchestra seasons have been canceled. You know, it, it was amazing when I had a, a totally packed schedule and in a matter of a week, I heard from each group individually. I have work all over. I've worked in Iowa and Milwaukee and in Madison. So here's in the pictures here, we have the Madison Symphony Orchestra. You can see me right, I'm near the center, but I'm three off from the center to the right. And then you can see me there. That's a picture of us in the pit in the Ma Milwaukee Ballet Orchestra. But all my work, it was canceled in a matter of a week. And it just, it just, um, yeah, it was, it was gut wrenching. It, it was a moment that, I mean, we all had this happen in our own careers and it's a moment that we can't, we can't really explain other than we're in it together. We're doing this all together. So, but I realized um, it, through reflection that I've overcome a similar obstacle before. Um, I talked a little bit about athletics and I'll get into that a bit more. But in the pandemic, I realized that I had unplanned free time. Suddenly I had time to get those things done that was always on the back burner and that was um, my dissertation work. So I'll talk a little bit about research in a minute. That was stimulating to my brain and, and gave me a sense of purpose for sure. So another thing that I got to do, um, rechanneling my energy, is work with my wonderful students. I started teaching at the University of Wisconsin Mead Witter School of Music this past fall. And um, these are my wonderful students. While there's so many challenges to starting a new job working online, there's some really cool things that we've been able to do, like bring in a guest artist from, this is Professor Pena um, here in the top center of this photo and she teaches at the University of Oregon and with a click of a button she was in our classroom so that's been really cool um, we've been doing a lot of read making online having to do that I've used a document camera as well as we take photos of our reads this is a, a whiteboard where I draw where I suggest for them to scrape on their reads so as oboists we all make our own reads and it's something that we work really really hard at um, during our university years uh, so, so teaching online has been, uh, been a real, a real interesting thing when it's a new situation. Um, being a new faculty member, you always want someone to advise you and the members of the Wingro Wing Quintet have done that for me immensely. It's been so wonderful having their, um, advice and encouragement throughout a year that is not the typical year so uh the 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 members of the wing quintet um, are the professors of clarinet bassoon horn oboe and flute and so we are the woodwind area and it it's really nice working with them um, while we would normally be performing as a quintet we actually had to also reinvent that and this past fall our recital um, was a series of solo, duet, and trio recordings. So we haven't quite yet performed as a quintet. We had to record our parts separately, and then we had an audio engineer um, get those pieces together where it looks kind of like we're playing on, on the stage together. But um, one portion that I contributed to the recital was an English horn solo. Um, and so you're going to hear my introduction as well as my performance of that. 
I'm Lindsay Flowers, the new oboist in the Wing Grab Wing Quintet, and I'll be performing an English horn piece by Elliot Carter entitled A Six Letter Letter. This piece was written for the Swiss oboist Heinz Holliger to be performed as an encore to Elliot Carter's oboe concerto. Holliger premiered these two works at the 90th birthday party of the Swiss conductor Paul Sacher. Carter takes the six letters of Paul Sacher's last name, S-A-C-H-E-R, and forms a musical cryptogram. He adds the letter E to either side of his last name, and he takes the E-S, and it is represented by the note E-flat, A by an A, C by C, H by a B, E by an E, and R-E, Ray, by a D. So the letter starts with addressing Sacher. So he spells his name S A C H E R S A C H E R. And then he takes just those six notes and builds an entire piece on it. We have some beautiful melodies, some jazzy rhythms, some ethereal moments that utilize the English horn harmonics and a bit of rock and roll and it ends also with a sign off to soccer it's it's a sort of reminiscent moment maybe a nod to the 90 years of the conductor's life
So if you'd like to hear our next recital, it's actually on March 26th. Um, the Wing Row will probably, we're planning to play something as a quintet, whether that be recorded um, and edited together, but um, we hope you'll join us then. We've done some educational engagement work uh, lately, which has been really exciting. We've carried in some materials for non-music classrooms. There are schools presenting arts festivals um, school-wide, as well as Bucky's Classroom is a program that the university does bringing us into a classroom virtually. And so we've done some of those visits. We've also zoomed into high school band programs across the state of Wisconsin and in Minnesota, which has been really cool. A lot of times we will talk a bit about our recital process for last fall and how we recorded things. And a lot of those students are doing some of the same projects. So that's been really fun to connect with them on that. And then oftentimes we'll go into breakout rooms with our instrument areas, give them coaching. Specifically, that etude you heard that I played on oboe earlier was a recording that we shared with the band programs before our visits. So the students could study the repertoire and then we coach them on that repertoire um, during our visits. So that's a bit about what I've been doing lately. Uh, uh, going way back, I uh, went to college to play volleyball. This was my world. This was everything I ever worked for um, through elementary, middle school, high school. It was to be an athlete at college and then to be a volleyball player at a college and then to get an athletic training major and a coaching minor and coach collegiate volleyball. That's all I ever saw myself doing until freshman year I showed up. I played all of preseason and the first week of the season, I had excruciating nerve pain down my leg. And in a matter of two days, I was having back surgery. So that rocked my world completely, cut everything that I every minute of every day focused on, cut it out completely. And I was on my back doing I couldn't do anything and it, boy it was frustrating and this is something that now I see it is is like I have gone through this before and I've had to completely change the direction of my life before and so like with the pandemic happening this is like something that I know I can do it and I know it was for the better and so whatever is coming of this, whether I it goes back to performing a lot live, whether I'm doing a lot more teaching now, um, this is all for the better. This is something that I, even with all the heartache and everything that went through with volleyball and with music this past year, I know that um, it's it's all happening for a reason and, and it's going to be a, a great thing. So these pictures are kind of fun. These are my college, my college teammates. And this is a coach that was really influential um, on me and my future. Um, this is my oboe teacher and she believed in me and uh, got me going. So this is now I'm getting serious about music and I really channeled the frustration and you know every minute that I was in the weight room then what am I going to do with my time I can't be doing that anymore or I don't even have purpose to do that anymore and so when I was even though I was trying to get back on the court it was always this this battle of like being constantly sidelined and I just it was so frustrating but the rigorousness of music studies and being able to get back on the court to being front and center on the stage it just like felt so similar also working individually in the practice room um, um it, if like for volleyball if i had extra moment like some downtime i might set the ball in my living room a hundred times to myself while reading the name across the ball no spinning nothing like just the control and finesse and focus even in my downtime and i like a lot of my musician friends think i'm a little crazy because i'm just constantly listening to music i'm constantly singing i'm maybe on a walk outside conducting the music to myself and it's just that overall all-encompassing energy that athletics have um it really translated to the music and it was all about the process. Maybe we came in second place at a tournament and the understanding um, how to come back to practice the next day, that resilience, the determination, the teamwork, and, and the finesse of like imagining 
wor working through the game, but it's all about the process. It was not about that one tournament. There's going to be a tournament in two weekends and we could qualify for nationals at that point. And it's the same thing with auditions. It's the same thing with our performances. Every performance, it doesn't have to be an end goal. Sure, it's a moment in time when people are enjoying the music, but leading up to up up to that, it's just, it's all the process and enjoying it, enjoying that throughout. Um, a little bit about these photos. This is an orchestra conductor in college who gave me many opportunities to solo with the orchestra. Um, this is a, a double concerto that we played actually with my best friend Eve on flute and then some chamber music stuff that we were able to do. And being at a smaller, a smaller college, I was at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Being there, I was able to um, get these solo opportunities that maybe I wouldn't have gotten at such a large school. Um, I did summer music festivals, which one summer I met Mr. Mack. He is the long-term principal oboist of the Cleveland Orchestra, and he is like, you know, you could really do this. And that that was when I knew I. he is someone that I idolized through recordings, through understanding his teaching um, philosophies as well as his strong pedagogical lineage and I just wanted to be a part of that and that he believed in me it just meant the world to me so um, then I just realized that you know sometimes I could have thought that I went to a small school I didn't go to a conservatory and and I was I was wasting time with athletics well that's definitely not the truth everybody has their own route and and the the grit that that volleyball gave me it was something that I could carry into sport, carry into music, and and it was something something cool. So being at a small school, I just knew I had to get to a large a large graduate program. And so this bottom picture is a picture of our oboe studio. Our two professors, Mr. Rowe and Miss Stroman, are on on the edges of that. But I mean, we had anywhere from twenty two to twenty six students every year, and just getting to rub shoulders and hear their playing was so inspiring for me. And I just knew I had to saturate myself with many experiences and I knew I could do that at Indiana University. Um, in the summertime, four years, I went to the Aspen Music Festival. And this is a picture in the top left corner of me getting to play with my teacher at that festival, Miss DuVos in the orchestra. It's really cool to get to play alongside your mentors. And then the fun ski picture is my friend Joanna from the Indiana Oboe Studio. I'm really close friends with her. We went back a few years to go skiing in Aspen. So it's funny how all these worlds, they all, it, everything that we do affects everything in our lives. And we're, I just feel like I'm really a summation of all my experiences. So from there, from my graduate school, I did a pre-professional training program with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. Um, we did, it's a, it's a training program um, performance-based where we are mentored by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra musicians, as well as um, uh, the conductors that we play for are oftentimes the conductors that are conducting the CSO that week. And so that was a really eye-opening experience for me, learning, learning that sort of stuff. I was also a part of a fellowship program with the Civic Orchestra that did a lot of community engagement work. We wanted to bring music outside the Symphony Center Concert Hall into, into the greater community. And one of the greatest projects that we did was called the Bach Brandenburg Marathon, where we played all six Brandenburg Concerti in one day at three different venues around the city. And um, this effort was led by our artistic director, Yo-Yo Ma, as well as um, uh, some uh, community leaders. Another community leader that we worked with, here's a picture of one of our meetings, our planning meetings. Um, this is one with all the fellows here where we were talking about how to make this work and what the music looked like and every, how, we, how we can make it work and reach our audiences. In the bottom right here, you see this meeting here where we were with a uh, community transformationist, uh, Theaster Gates. He has art incubation sites on the south side of Chicago. And so um, we got to perform at all his venues. We broke up all our groups and spread out around six of his venues. This is one of our rehearsals where we were rehearsing with um, Maestro Kramer, where he taught us about Baroque style because we wanted to make sure we were also performing at the highest level. 
Um, on the left side here, these are all, um, this was a meeting day where we performed for one another in the orchestra. Uh, Yo-Yo here was like, everybody sit under the piano and feel how the music uh, reverberates in your body. And so we're sitting under the piano. How does it feel when you listen to music in a dark space? So we played here. Um, there's a group playing and we're all surrounding them and it's the lights are off and the ambiance that that creates. Um, as well as how does it feel when people are clustered tightly around you and you're playing with as much energy as you can? Here's a little look at the day that we had. Um, this was actually a, a time when Yo-Yo coached us on on the music. So this was Brandenburg Concerto 1 with three oboes. Super cool. Um, we had a good time there. So we started the day over here on the right side in the top right corner. Um, this is one of the arts incub incubation sites. This is a youth center um, where they uh, created a, a bunch of artwork um, on the south side of Chicago, and we performed around the audience, which was to help them feel the performance. And it was tons of energy. And along with our Brandenburg, we played a bunch of carols, and they all sang along. So that was fun. This, and then the second venue that we played at was the Chris Kindle Mart in downtown Chicago. Um, Yo-Yo came and listened to our performance, which was pretty cool. Um, seeing him front and center, cheering us on, drinking his his glug and eating bratwurst. And here, here's our, our group playing there. And then we ended up our final performance, which was a more formal event where we performed for a sold out crowd at the 4th Street Presbyterian Church. And Yo-Yo jumped in on one of the concerti and made a surprise performance on that, which is pretty cool. And that great after party. <laughs> Lots of energy that day. We were so tired, but there's so much energy. Okay, so this Brandenburg Marathon inspired me to write a blog article on relating it to audition preparation. A lot of times we have to perform under pressure. And how do we do that when when we... Um, how do we do that in the heat of the moment? When I look back at the Brandenburg Concerto, I could see that when we were at the most informal environment was quite possibly the most um the best performance of the day so when we performed at the in arts incubation site maybe that was even our best music making of the day and i don't know if it was because we were fresh or if it because we were in a comfortable environment or even it wasn't even comfortable but it just it felt like we were connecting with our community and it had a, a meaning beyond us ourselves playing perfectly and by doing that it was able to it was able to take us out of our tunnel vision of performing perfectly and to um, have have meaning beyond ourselves. So this also was so influential on my life and my approach to music making that I kept thinking, why didn't I have these experiences back in college? And many, many orchestras and universities are starting to move in this direction that we need to be other focused and we need to think beyond our tunnel vision. But in music making, we really do have to hone in on our techniques. So how can we balance that? And so I was inspired to write, um, do dissertation research on community engagement practices and um, one of the books that I read that was really cool was by Peter Block, and it's called Community. And um, he says that the arts are an essential part of the story of what it means to be a better human being in the community. And that that um, this this book has a lot of community building activities for the classroom, which is like what we did with our fellowship. And then we had to bridge it out to the greater, like the school of music, which was like bridging it out to the rest of the civic orchestra. And then how do we connect in effective ways with people in our community and building the bigger community as artists? Um, now looking a little bit about my research, we don't have too much time here, but I just wanted to say that um, the, the, what I discovered was that, um, we need to have these experiences for students, um, in order to learn what skills are needed. So my, my, uh, or this is also a cool book. So this book by David Wallace is all about music, how you connect with your audience, but I could see it being applicable for any artistic endeavor or just how to connect, how to connect with people when 
you're doing something different than what they normally do. Um, and so the, that book is really good, especially for musicians. But um, so my research questions are, what are the variety of community engagement activities that all of my interview participants have undertaken? I interviewed five professional musicians and four professional music administrators. Um, and what do they deem as the qualities of successful community engagement and what personal and artistic skills are needed for successful community engagement and how might music majors learn them? Yeah, one of the interview participants said that it's an the artist's utmost responsibility to use their craft as a tool to get into the community and talk about life's bigger issues. So uh, my research findings um, it, it revealed themes of attracting new audiences to the concert hall, bringing music to people who do not have access or are unable to come to the concert hall, performing music in non-traditional concert spaces, and providing quality K-12 educational initiatives. Um, what successful cre uh, community engagement looked like to the participants was relating it to the local culture, choosing the right community partners, and measuring the metric outcomes. The personal and artistic skills needed for community engagement um, that were highlighted the most was the skill of communication, the ability to be flexible in your demeanor, and to be able to deal with perfectionism. So some of the findings um, for attracting new audiences to the concert hall is to elevate what is at the heart of the community participants. And oftentimes, when, one of the interview participants said that if you can introduce musicians to their audiences, it'll heighten their energetic curiosity for the music. When we um, want to bring music outside the concert hall to people who are unable to come. One of the coolest stories was about a group of musicians who went to um, a center for autism called Easter Seals, and they played for a group in the audience. And, and the interesting thing was they thought it wasn't going so well because it was so noisy and it wasn't it, they weren't sure the musicians weren't sure if it was going well, but at the end they found out from one of the, the personal aides that in the back of the classroom, one of the um, participants who has been learning to write on their board. Hi, my name is um, when we did our personal introductions, they finally, for the first time after weeks of work, working on it, was able to write that on their board and do their introduction. And so it seemed like music and relating to people was something that was able to get um, through with that. So performing music in non-traditional concert spaces, um, there's so many, they gave so many examples that were really innovative and really cool. Um, but musicians, museums um, was pretty cool because someone could choose their level of engagement. So the musician talked about they prepared music that related to the art being displayed as well as, I mean, there were many deep reasons for that. and they gave a presentation before performing, but even if someone didn't hear that presentation, they might be able to absorb the artwork on all levels of cognitive understanding. So engage with it on their own terms, whether they stopped and listened for a while, whether they just walked through the room, and um, that was an effective way of um, bringing music to people's lives. Um, in the K through 12 educational initiatives, a uh, standout one was when uh, the musicians went into classrooms to do interdisciplinary music presentations on themes like courage or truth to power or identity or the American voice. What do these things mean and how does music serve these, um, these, these purposes? Um, with the successful community engagement, one of my favorite topics is relating to local culture. So people watching, going around the city, sitting in a coffee shop, are people on their phones getting their information? Are they reading the brochures at the front door? Are they talking to one another? Are they reading the paper? Figuring those things out is a way for you to connect with your marketing as well as um, learning more about the local community. One of the coolest performances was of a, a musician who played a piece entitled Your Air, which was um, relating directly to the pandemic and how how breathing and how 
everything going on with the George Floyd, he can't breathe. And all of, all of that was a very, like the week of her performance. And, um, before, before she gave, um, her rendition of this piece, she set it up by having a moment of silence for everybody to think about the circulation of breath and the importance of air. And then from that silence, she, uh, performed and apparently it was amazing. I wish I could have been there. So really cool. And another thing is sometimes we, we need to worry a lot about representation, um, with the classical world of music making. Uh, sometimes we have to acknowledge when we aren't the person to be exactly that voice, but understanding that if we're taking music to a rural community, our perspectives from if I live in Madison and the person I'm playing with is from Chicago and someone else is from Detroit and they're coming together to play in a rural community, one of the interview participants spoke about how that um, brought diversity alone to of experience, of real world experience to that part of the community, which is really, really cool. Also, they um, they um, involved a lot of local people and composed music um, based on the sounds of that rural area, which is cool. So creating the purpose of beyond the music itself is something that fortified the experiences and relatedness of the performers and their audiences. So we have to create something innovative and something new by having a community partner but just getting together with that community partner is something that is creating something new on to metrics it was important everybody mentioned that it was important that um, you have great qualitative and quantitative metrics of your community engagement projects because these are not the traditional course of orchestras and how do we create validity of that um, so there, there are some yeah cool examples of that. But um, one advice that they gave was um, in our collaboration, when you engage with a community partner, this is what it has looked like in the past. Here's what we can do, but how can we make it special for your group? Our la my last research question is communication. Um, we want to use like that last quote that I read. It inspires ownership um, with your collaborator. And so how do we get people to engage? There are a few people who never want to participate. There are a few people who always will participate, but the question remains, how can I entice those who are unsure if they want to participate? And that's the majority of people. The last two skills of um, needed by students is uh, flexibility. So like being able to have a good group dynamic, likability, respect, and this stuff is what's transferable to the stressful moments in group work. And then dealing with perfectionism, um, being able to work through and willing to show up for community engagement work is something quite difficult for musicians and, but it oftentimes reframes their perspective for performing and not taking themselves too seriously. And oftentimes they performed better. Being willing to make mistakes, to be vulnerable, and to try new things has great rewards. So the curriculum that I've designed around the research findings is just to help students get those experiences um, um, to be able to use music in the way that way in the future, but also be able to help their music making, help their learning. Maybe they're under the watchful eye of a teacher at all times, their, their major area professor critiquing them, but performing community engagement work is an opportunity to get that out of their head and put it into practice in a healthy way and see how those two things balance each other out. So Yo-Yo says the cultural and educational work depends on one thing, that no matter what we do in the art sciences and architecture, architecture, it only matters what people remember. So making it memorable. In reflection of this whole presentation, um, what experiences in your life have shaped you into who you are today? I kind of went in into that a bit today about how athletics and influenced my music, which influenced me being able to be resilient when my whole world came crashing down once more. And how, how is that your life, how does that shape you into who you are today? 
How can you use your morning ritual and little moments interspersed throughout your day to get you towards your aspirations? How can you use areas of your expertise to serve your communities and to seek out and elevate the work of your collaborators? Twyla Tharp, she said, the creative life has the nourishing power that we normally associate with food, love, and faith. Lindsay Flowers, thank you so much uh, for your inspiring story there. Hi, everybody. Fran Paleo, uh, Badger Talks producer. Um, you know, if I get stuck on an island and I have to survive, you'd be one of the people I want to be stuck with, Lindsay, because you clearly take any obstacle and like turn it into something positive. So how smart of you to take this time to work on your dissertation. And I'm sure there's so many other that have focused on other things at this time too. And it's something yeah. we just have to do um, to get through. And actually the series you're on now, Badger Talks Live, was sort of a reaction to this COVID and it's how we're finding ways to reach more people too. So thank you so much for all of your outreach work and for taking this time too to reach out to other people through this series. Okay. Uh, and Tom Caught, at Mills Mus Music Library has a question for you. So. What sorts of ideas do you have for music community engagement and outreach in Madison when we someday get past the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, well, uh, when I, there's all the different ways to connect with our communities. One with the K through 12 initiatives, there's um, a lot that we can do because we have such a variety of schools and diversity in our city. And I believe that we can, um, get in there and talk about the things that matter in life. We don't need to talk necessarily about music, but by showing them that we use music to talk about the real things in life that matter, that that is what is so much more powerful than anything. And by displaying our passion for music and what we love to do as performers and teachers through music is something that will rub off on on students and they'll create that energy around their topic that they're interested in even if they're not interested in music hopefully they can use what we are inspired by what we work hard at to to work for them in their in their stuff um i think relating to local culture is so important so understanding your city understanding honestly i'm new to madison i've only lived this is my third year of living in madison and even in the middle of that i lived in milwaukee for a year back and forth and and it is about getting to know the community so that's a goal that i have for myself um understanding what are at the hearts of the people who live here, as well as understanding the greater community around Madison. Excellent, very good points. And I did post in the chat uh, a couple of links to the books that you referenced as well. Cool. Uh, so thank you for sharing that information. Uh, I, I have a question for you for our viewers who maybe aren't musicians and don't know a lot about the oboe or the English horn. Can you talk about the distinction between the two? Yeah. Yeah. So I like to say that the the tenor oboe, the English horn is like is like the uncle. It's a bigger, fuller, deeper, richer voice. And then the little oboe is maybe like a younger child. So it has that smaller voice, but we still want to get it to sing. So the oboe and English horn both have double reeds on the English horn. We have a vocal that is like an extension of our reed. Um, the reeds that we play on are made of bamboo cane that we have um, split and then it, we gouge out the center and then we fold it over a tube um, and then we tie it on, clip it open and then shave it down. So in that one picture of the reed making stuff you saw, um, it has, you can see all the definition of the reed. We have the back that has like thinner sections. We have a thicker section and then the thin tip. So we get our vibration, we get the stability of the pitch as well as we get the, the core of the tone um, through the way that we scrape our reeds. So the English horn reeds are bigger. They're just like the big brother of the oboe reeds. And, um, and yeah, so the English horn gets all the good pastoral moments or the, the sappy moments, maybe in, in uh, you'll hear it in movie music and it often is the tearjerker. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks for sharing that. And that Carter piece was just absolutely beautiful too. Thanks. So if you 
try to convince someone that the oboe is the most beautiful instrument uh, on the planet, what is the piece that you would tell people to listen to? Oh boy. There's some really, Not the spot. <laughs> that's okay. There are many, but maybe one of my favorite oboe moments, um, well, in Mahler symphonies, he always has the oboe represent the sublime. And it's just like, uh, time stops as well as there's a solo in Strauss Alpine symphony that it's like the whole buildup, the buildup of the mountain, the big mountains. And then it's just the oboe coming out. It's so gorgeous. It just, it just flows and that's really beautiful. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Really appreciate it. There are so many beautiful <laughs> oboe spots, you know, different pieces. Well, Lindsay Flowers, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Um, Everybody tune in next week, Tuesday at noon, we'll be having Brooke Norstad from the UW Geology Museum, and she'll be talking about stories in stone, things that we can tell by looking uh, at stones and parts of the earth um, that can tell us stories from millions and billions of years ago. So please join in. And as always, visit badgertalks.wist.edu to see the upcoming schedule of talks, and you can sign up for our email list there too. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thank you.